Hello, and welcome to this presentation on the Battle of Falkirk 1298, Knights versus Pikes. In this presentation, we'll be looking at each side, the leaders, the weapons they used, what happened in the battle, and why the English won. Sorry about that, Scotland, but at least you won the war overall, so that's good for you. Anyway, before I get too controversial, I'm going to move on to a character who's completely uncontroversial in every single way, William Wallace. All right, William Wallace is controversial, and it's largely the fault of that man on the right. That's Australian actor and director Mel Gibson playing William Wallace in the film Braveheart. The trouble is, Braveheart bears very little relation to the actual history. If I was to show you the Braveheart version of the Battle of Falkirk, it would give you very, very little idea as to what really happened at the battle. William Wallace did not wear blue paint on his face. He did not wear tartan. And he certainly didn't speak with a very unconvincing Scottish accent. The Victorian stained glass window on the left is probably a more accurate version of what William Wallace looked like. But whatever the truth is, it's a shame that Mel Gibson didn't stick to the facts. Wallace was a courageous and very bold leader. Just sticking to those facts would have made for an excellent film, I'm sure. And one that I could have used in my lessons. Never mind, let's move on. Let's consider the armies. On the face of things, both armies were quite similar. Both sides had infantry, or foot soldiers. Both sides had cavalry, mounted knights. And both sides had archers for ranged weapons. But the way that they used them in battle and their equipment was subtly different. Let's have a look at a couple of examples, starting with the English. The English used their cavalry like a wrecking ball. Heavily armoured for the time in a mail coat with a great helm and shield, they would run through enemy lines with their lances couched and they could stab anyone in their way. They would have a great big sword as well to bash anyone that got in their way and slice and cut and stab and hack at the enemy lines. Used correctly, the knights were very difficult to beat indeed. The English often relied on enemies being so scared of the mounted knights that they'd simply run away. How they were raised was interesting as well. Feudal armies consisted of knights who owed knight service to the king. For at least 40 days of the year, they were expected to devote themselves to their, the army and to their training. This meant that they were very well trained, but not necessarily very well disciplined. You see, in the Middle Ages, most knights, being aristocrats, were not very used to being told what to do. And in an era before modern communications, getting the message down the line to them before they just charge off and do whatever they like can be more more difficult than you might expect. Their horses, whilst mobile, did struggle rather on boggy ground, and in some of the battlefields of Scotland this would prove to be difficult. Let's have a little look at uh, the other side, the Scottish army. The Scots had developed a way of fighting with pikes. This was a really good tactic, because the pikemen did not require a lot of training. Take it from me, I've learned how to use a pike, I did it in about half an hour, and I'd back myself with 300 others to keep the horses away from me. So, when they say any idiot could learn to use a pike, I'll let you draw your own conclusions there. A pike is about five metres long and tipped with a steel spike on the end. There is one disadvantage, though. If you are carrying a pike, you need both hands to use it. That means you can't carry a shield. So if you're on your own, you're better off bidding your pike and running away as fast as you possibly can. Many of the Scots were not very heavily armoured. Instead, they relied on discipline, stay in formation, point your pikes towards the enemies in a row as thick as a hedge and really the horses won't be able to get too close to you. If anyone's ever ridden a horse you'll know that these animals are not especially stupid and they have a very strong sense of self-preservation. Even a trained war horse when confronted with a, a hedge of sharpened sticks will probably stop, shy away or possibly throw off the rider. And that's very much what the English discovered the year before Falkirk in 1297 at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. As the English crossed the bridge bit by bit, the Scottish Shiltrons, these are formations of pikes, were able to isolate them and finish them off. It was a crushing and humiliating defeat for the English. So at Falkirk, they needed to learn from that, and they needed to move on to better tactics. I mentioned the Shiltron. The nature of it is like this. Shiltrons are disciplined infantry formations, with multiple rows of pikes facing towards the outside. Used properly, the cavalry simply cannot break through. The English had learned this to their cost at Stirling Bridge, as I'd said before, showing that the Shiltron was greater than the knight, and they could really spoil their day. 
On the English side, their commander, Edward I, otherwise known as Longshanks for how tall he was, was an experienced commander, and he did learn from Stirling Bridge, and he was determined that the same mistakes would not be made at Falkirk. Now, before I move on to the next slide, I should point out something about this map. It's been drawn using a very uh, high-tech piece of uh, software uh, that cartographers use. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just going to stop that. I drew it in Microsoft Paint. Yeah, it's not very good. In fact, it's rubbish. But it'll give you the basic idea of what we think the battlefield looked like. As for the animations, I can only apologise. This is the first one I made a couple of years ago. And, well, they do get better in the later maps, so just give me a chance. Let's have a look at the battlefield. Yeah, it's not very good, is it? Sorry about that. Anyway, Falkirk lies roughly halfway between Glasgow and Edinburgh in Scotland. Both armies had been searching for each other, with the English rather more keen to find the Scots, knowing that they outnumbered them. As it happened, you might be wondering why William Wallace chose to fight on this ground at all. Well, the truth is, he didn't choose to. The English army spotted him and advanced upon him in an aggressive move. William Wallace had to make the best of a bad job and mount the best defence he could. Here's where he positioned his army. Now, there was quite a lot of sense to this. First of all, Calendar Wood was behind them. If everything, everything went horribly wrong, they could always retreat back into Calendar Wood. Secondly, the marshes were in front of them. This might help break up the English cavalry charge as the horses struggled through the soft ground. However, there was one crucial weakness with this position. It's not really William Wallace's fault, but his flanks are terribly exposed here. But it is difficult to know what more he could have done. Now, in terms of numbers, the Scots had 1,000 cavalry, around 1,000 archers, and about 4,000 pikemen. The pikemen were arranged in shiltrons, shown by the circles here. The archers had their own flanks protected by the, sh the shiltrons. I suppose the uh, theory was that if the cavalry got anywhere near the shiltrons, they'd be in dire trouble anyway and probably wouldn't get near to the archers. We'll see how that works out for them. Now let's have a look at the English army. Edward I's English army was far larger than the Scottish army. Now, any medieval battle figures that you look at have to be taken with a massive pinch of salt. The chronicles are often very boastful, and even when they're not boastful, they're usually incomplete. It is possible that a feudal army of this time could have been of la as large as the, as the English one, but it's unlikely they ever got much larger than this. Simply paying, or rather supplying, these soldiers with the necessary food, and of course all the food for the horses as well, would have been a massive operation for the time. So, let's take the figures that we have anyway. Firstly, they had around 2,000 cavalry, soundly outnumbering the Scots. The archers were 5,000 longbowmen. I'll come back to those in a moment. And finally, the infantry, 12,500. Now, the Scots numbered 6,000. As you can see, the English number almost 20,000. So even if the figures are rather exaggerated, the Scots are still terribly outnumbered. Back to the longbows, though. These are not just any old archers. The longbow was, well probably more than six feet long in most cases, and it required incredible training and strength to use it. It could be used accurately, it could be loosed quickly, notice I didn't say fired, there was no fire involved with uh, shooting an arrow, uh, and also you needed incredible strength to use it. To give you an idea of what sort of strength was needed, imagine trying to pick up a fully grown man with just the two fingers on your right hand. That's the sort of weight that you had to pull back on the string in order to get it as far back as your ear and loose an arrow as far as you could. Now that might mean that a skilled longbowman could shoot an arrow anything up to 250 or even 300 metres, which for the time was an incredibly long range indeed. Now the first thing that happened in this battle is actually more to do with the cavalry and the nobility. Because yes, they didn't wait for any orders, the English cavalry simply charged. It is likely that they saw that Wallace's flanks were exposed and thought that this was a good opportunity to get into the thick of it and get a quick and glorious victory. This was a dangerous move to say the least. At Stirling Bridge, a similar move had resulted in the deaths of many, many English knights at the hands of the Shiltrons, and the same could have happened here. But the Scots countercharged with their cavalry. The next bit's rather controversial. Historians can't uh, agree as to whether this is uh, the Scots nobility really rather abandoning William Wallace and showing great disloyalty, or whether they simply saw that the numbers were against them and figured it would be better to live to fight another day. But they retreated and were gone. This left the archers exposed in between the Shiltrons. At this point, Edward sent forward the rest of his cavalry to take down those archers. 
I'm sure a few horses were taken down by arrows as they approached, but not many, and the archers themselves were hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with charging archers. Many of them before the, uh, the uh, uh, sorry, charging cavalry, that was rubbish. Um, many of the archers would have run away even before the cavalry reached their lines. You can possibly tell what's going to happen next. The pike shiltrons held firm. If they didn't, they would have been chased down by the cavalry. Instead, they were tightly packed, hundreds of men at a time. Little armour, no shields, and very vulnerable to archers. Edward saw this and sent his longbowmen forward into the marches. The archers loosed off their arrows and turned those poor shiltrons into pincushions. Sorry about the animations. You should really see my Battle of Hastings animations. They're much better than this one. Anyway, we're reaching the end of the battle now. What was left of these tattered pike shiltrons could be easily finished off by Edward's overwhelming force of infantry. Whoever was left retreated into Calendar Wood and they were gone. The point was the English had won. William Wallace had escaped, but he was soon recaptured and taken to the Tower of London. There he suffered a traitor's death, hanged, drawn and quartered. And believe me, there was no way that William Wallace was screaming, Freedom! at the top of his lungs, like in that film. In fact, the top of his lungs were probably spread all over the yard of the Tower of... You know what, I'm not going to pursue that line of inquiry. That's rather disgusting. Let's have a quick recap of what's happened at the Battle of Falkirk, though. Firstly, Edward decided to attack Wallace in an aggressive move. This forced Wallace to take a position which was not ideal and his flanks were exposed. Wallace chose a good position behind the marches, but he did leave his flanks exposed. Not much more he could have done. Thirdly, despite the English cavalry failing to beat the Chiltrons, Scottish cavalry and archers were forced off the battlefield. They were heavily outnumbered, but even still that left the Chiltrons undefended. English longbows and crossbows dealt heavy damage to the Scottish Chiltrons. Edward's infantry finished off the remaining Scottish soldiers. And lastly, Wallace managed to escape, but he was captured soon after. Let's consider how this might look in the exam. Have a look at this exam question. Explain why the importance of foot soldiers grew compared to the importance of cavalry in the First War of Scottish Independence. 12 marks. I'll be honest with you, it's unlikely the question would be entirely phrased like this. But we're only looking at one battle in this presentation, so I've narrowed the focus of this rather than broadening it to other medieval battles, such as perhaps Agincourt in 1415 uh, or others that you might want to wish to mention. In the exam, at least with the Edexcel exam board, you will also be given stimulus material to go on. You may use the following in your answer. The use of Schiltrons, the importance of archers. You must also use information of your own. Well, let's pull this apart a little bit. Well, first of all, we are having to argue that the importance of foot soldiers grew compared to cavalry. So our foot soldiers here are people like the pikemen, the infantry and the archers. I'm sure you'll agree they play quite an important role in this battle. Let's have a look at the stimulus material. The use of shiltrons, the importance of archers. Well, it makes sense to mention both of these things in our answers here, but you don't have to. What is uh, indicated, though, is that you must include information of your own. So perhaps a safe strategy is to include three main paragraphs. A paragraph explaining how Schiltrons showed that uh, foot soldiers grew in importance compared to cavalry. A paragraph explaining the same for archers. And then perhaps a paragraph of our own to show our own knowledge and really nail down those marks. An examiner marking this will award six marks for your knowledge and six marks for your explanation. Therefore, a good tip is this. For each paragraph, make a point. Give an example, explain how it supports your point, and then make a link back to the question. Have a go at it now, and pause the video if you're going to do that. Well, that was quick. Actually, you should probably spend somewhere around 18 to 20 minutes on a question of that sort of length, but no longer. Here's an example answer. In this example answer, I've colour-coded various parts of each paragraph to show you how they're composed. In red we've got the point, in a sort of brown colour we've got the examples, in green for the further explanations and extra detail, and finally purple for our analysis linked back to the question. One way the importance of foot soldiers grew was the Scottish use of shiltrons. At Stirling Bridge the English cavalry was defeated by the shiltrons as the cavalry could not break through the tightly packed pike formations. 
This was also shown at the Battle of Falkirk, when the Scots again tried to use po large formations of pikes. This shows growing importance of foot soldiers, as it showed that organised pikes could defeat powerful cavalry. That's the first of my stimulus points used as well. Let's move on to the second. Another way the importance of foot soldiers grew was the use of archers. An example of this was the English use of longbowmen. Longbowmen had long range and could rain arrows down on poorly armoured soldiers like pikemen. This happened at the Battle of Falkirk when Edward I used longbows to destroy the Scottish Shiltrons. This shows the growing importance of foot soldiers as longbows became the decisive weapon at Falkirk. Again, making sure that I'm linking back to the question. Thirdly, the declining importance of cavalry was due to the increasing importance of foot soldiers. At Falkirk, the role of cavalry was less important to the outcome of the battle than the use of foot soldiers. The battle was won when the archers destroyed the Shiltrons and the infantry chased the survivors away. This shows the growing importance of foot soldiers, as in earlier times the cavalry were generally the ones who could have decided the outcomes of battles. Now perhaps there I should have backed that up with another example. Well, one really springs to mind, but it doesn't fall within the Edexcel date range for the Warfare 3 time topic. Can you think of which battle I'm thinking of? That's right, Hastings. At Hastings, William the Conqueror used his cavalry to charge down the English as they left the shield wall, and then he won the battle, apart from a certain amount of arrow-in-the-eye nonsense. But I digress. My answer's still lacking something, though. Let's get a last bit of analysis in there. I've probably got enough uh, specific knowledge now to get my AO1 knowledge marks, but a little bit more analysis couldn't hurt. In conclusion, the growing importance of foot soldiers is shown by the declining importance of the cavalry. As commanders relied more on soldiers like longbows and pikemen, both of which could be effective against cavalry when used skillfully, the training and use of large numbers of foot soldiers in battles increased. And that's really another point I could have made. Training. Although the longbow took a lot of very long and skilled uh, strength and training to use, by and large infantry were cheaper, easier to recruit and easier to train than the cavalry. And so you get a trend towards greater uh, proportions of infantry rather than cavalry uh, within armies. The decline of cavalry is a very, very long trend. It starts around about this time in the 1200s and arguably it lasts all the way up to World War I when the use of cavalry is shown to finally be completely outdated against modern weapons like machine guns. But all of that for another time. So finally, cavalry is in decline, not just because of those pikes, but also because of the longbows. Yes, eventually the longbow will show its strength against cavalry formations too, having such power and long range. The English showed this at Cressy in 1346, and crucially for us, at Agincourt in 1415, and that we'll look at another time. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye.